Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC Guy. Today, we're going to take a look at that age-old question of why railroad signals are red, yellow, and green. So if this is a question that's been keeping you up at night, stick around for the video. Hit that little red uh, subscribe button, and when the little bell comes up, click on it and click all. <laughs> Now, before we get started, I want to point out that a lot of the images that I'm going to be showing you here as part of this look at railroad signal colors were uh, taken from the Wikipedia site on railroad signaling in North America. And I want to point out that those uh, images are available for free use under the Creative Commons. And I really recommend taking a look at that Wikipedia site. It has a lot to offer and I have included a link to it in the description to this video. So take a look at that, and I will point out the ones that are not from that site, because there are a, a couple here that I have taken myself and included in this, but for a lot of this stuff, it's, it's just not readily available otherwise. So let's get started by taking a look at the history of signaling on railroads, and I think that will get us uh, where we want as far as answering this basic question. Now, right off here, you can see this is what's called a wooden ball signal. And these came into use back in the 1830s here in uh, the U.S. And the color and position of the ball basically was used to communicate with the train crews. They were not used for controlling train movements at first. The first example of that was by the New Haven Railroad in 1852. But Basically, though, you would haul a ball up there and that would give them permission, the train crew permission, to proceed or uh, to go ahead. And that's where the term highball came from, because when you hoisted it up this uh, pole, then you got a highball and you could proceed on, uh, on your journey. And so that's the origination of the term highball and highballing uh, on the railroad for um, express and very important trains because they would get the high ball signal all the way through. Similarly, if it was a red ball, they might have a red ball with a lantern associated with it so you could see it at night. And that's where the term red ball express came from because you might have a red ball run up the pole for them. And the use and color of these varied on all of the different railroads that use them. And that's a common thing that you'll see through all of this is that individual railroads decided exactly what they wanted to do and they did their own thing. Now, another type of signal that was used was a red disc located on a pole, and it was set so that it could revolve. So you could turn it one way to show red and stop a train, and turn it the other way, and the red would not appear. So that was one method that was used early on, and again, they were using red at that time. Now here, uh, in this image, this was a, a system that was used by the Reading Railroad. And up at the top, those are a set of various wooden veins painted different colors. And so the uh, guys in the tower could rotate those and the colors would show and it could indicate a train should stop or proceed or approach or whatever. Now, this is another one here. You can see up at the top, we've got semaphores uh, on the top of this apparatus, but there are two disc located directly over the tracks below them. And you can see that there's a swing bridge that is open in the background. Now those discs that have been lowered into position using a semaphore apparatus were called smash boards. And they were set like that so that if a train was coming through and didn't slow down or stop fast enough, they would smash into those boards and they were called sm smash boards for that reason. So another, you know, unique, innovative approach to, uh, to stopping trains, to say the least. In the 1840s, in the UK, the railroads over there adopted red, white, and green flags and lamps as a means of controlling the movement of trains. And then those were eventually incorporated into semaphores 
You can see this one here. I believe that's a Santa Fe uh, Railroad photograph. And the semaphore is located up on the top. Unfortunately, you can't see the signals. And they basically had your typical red, yellow, and green uh, color aspects on those. And these stayed in use in the U.S. into the early 1900s, and even much later than that on some railroads. You can find uh, photos of them still around. But by about 1916, they were generally obsolete. They were held to be obsolete by the railroads, and they weren't installing any new ones. Part of the reason for that is they had a lot of moving parts, and they were a maintenance headache. So anything else that came along was better in the long run for them. Now, initially in the UK, they used red, white, and green, but eventually they switched over to red, yellow, and green. The use of red and green in the UK came initially from the fact that in factories over there, red and green were used on factory equipment to indicate danger and uh, safety, respectively. So a red painted part of a machine would indicate that it was dangerous in use, stay away from it, and green would mean it was okay. And so they adopted those colors for use on the railroads. So that seems to be at least part of the reason that red and green came to be. Another thing, that was widely used for a while were these hall banjo uh, lights. And you can see it's sort of shaped like a banjo there at the top. And it was lit by a kerosene lamp on the inside there. And the interior was painted white, so it created a nice white reflective light out of there. And they also had silk cloth on a uh, wire frame that could be rotated in front of the lens and create a red light effect. So you had a red and a white light for a long time. And these stayed in use for something like 50 years on railroads here in the US. Okay, let's move into the modern era. Because by about 1900, the early 1900s, there was such a wide variety and diversity of lighting colors being used for various purposes and different types of signaling systems. So finally, in 1905, a uh, meeting was held of railway signaling experts. And one paper presented at that meeting was by a Dr. William Churchill. Now, he apparently uh, did a study for Corning Glass where he looked at the best colors to use for various purposes on the railroad. And one of the, the important things that came out of his study was something that, a phenomenon that he identified called red shift. And red shift is a phenomenon where when light travels through the atmosphere and there's any dust or dirt or other particles or gases or anything in the atmosphere, basically, uh, the light spectrum will shift towards the red end of the spectrum. As a result, he identified red as being the best color to use for a danger or warning color, and therefore to use for the stop color on railroad signals. His reasoning behind what that was, due to this red shift, if you get a yellow or a green or any other color that is shifted towards the red, and an engineer sees that and brings his uh, locomotive and train to a stop, you're better off uh, from a safety standpoint to have that happen and delay a train uh, unnecessarily than have it run through and crash into the rear of another train up ahead of it. So as a result of his presentations, uh, they went with the red for stop and the green as a clear signal. Now, there was some discussion though because he had recommend that white be used instead of yellow for the caution. And the reason that he felt that, that, that white would be better than, say, yellow, would be that at the time, a lot of the domestic lighting along railroads was by kerosene lights, which generally was yellow in color. So he felt that white would be better to use to distinguish railroad signals from uh, domestic signals along the railroad. Unfortunately, the rest of the, uh, of the, of the people at the meeting and, and at, at, at Corning did not agree, and yellow was adopted as the caution. Now, this image right here gives you a very good uh, feeling of why that red shift is so important. Because if we look back here, the most distant signal is number one, that's a red, and that means to stop and stay there. Number two, 
are the one after that. That is a stop and stay red. And then finally we get to three, which is a yellow, proceed with caution. But if you look at that signal, that looks red to me. So very easily that could be confused for a stop and stay as opposed to a yellow proceed. So that's a good example of this red shift phenomenon and why it was so important. This was readily adopted, and, and so these are the colors that are still widely in use today. Red for stop, yellow for approach, and green for clear. Also, various other colors that have been in use uh, over this time and are still might be seen today would be blue. Uh, purple was used until about 1952 when it was outlawed. White, lemon yellow, plain white, and various flashing uh, combinations of these. So there's a lot of things that you can see out there on the railroad. Now one thing that is very common use is the uh, the standard um, target signal, and this was made by Hall, the company that, originate, that originally used the banjo-shaped uh, signals, and you can see they're very similar in, in, in their approach. And you can see this one here is green, the next one is a red, and uh, obviously that's a stop, the previous one was a clear signal. So um, these are very, very popular on some railroads, still in, in use today, and you'll see those mixed in also with other types. These came in use about 1920. Uh, Hall saw the, you know, the, the handwriting on the wall. The banjo was just not uh, up to date, so they got rid of that, bought the patent to these target uh, lights, and started making these instead. And they came into wide use, like I said, in the 1920s. Also coming into use at that time were the triple aspects, like this one here. This is a photo of mine from Charlottesville, Virginia, and it's the, the, uh, the old CNO, now CSX track, is in the background, and that rail to the right, the old Southern Railway, now the Norfolk Southern Main Line, headed between Washington, D.C. and Atlanta. In this case, you can see a mixture. We have a three aspect showing red and a two aspect showing red. So these type of signals are what you see widespread in many railroads used today, along with the targets as well, as I just said. The great thing about the triple aspect, unlike the, the target signals, is they don't have any moving parts. You're not moving a disc around to change the color of the light. Whereas on these, you've just got, you know, three light bulbs, and now they're switching to LEDs. So you got a very low power draw and a very good bright light in many cases. If you compare that, though, to highway or, or traffic signals and traffic lights, the first one of those was... Uh, was used in Detroit, uh, Michigan in 1920. And by 1935, the Federal Highway Administration had mandated the use of red, yellow, and green for highway signals. Now, one thing you will notice, though, is on railroad uh, signals, the red is on the bottom, the green is on the top, okay? On highway signals, the red is on top, green is on the bottom. And that was done, as I understand, specifically to differentiate the two types of signals so that you wouldn't have railway engineers and car drivers confusing the two sets of signals and causing accidents. Well, that's it for today's video. Hopefully, I've answered your questions about why railroad signals are red, yellow, and green, and sometimes blue, and sometimes lunar white, and sometimes plain white, and various other iterations of flashing and that kind of thing. Now, in the description, I've included some links to websites where you can go to find out more about railroad signals here in North America. And they vary from anything from the Wikipedia site on railroad signals in North America that gives you a very general overview and from which I borrowed a lot of images for this presentation. And I want to point out that those uh, images are available for free use under the Creative Commons. And I really recommend taking a look at that Wikipedia site. It has a lot to offer. There are also other websites available that provide a much deeper dive into uh, various railroad signaling systems around the country and various others that uh, the NMRA has a site for it and various other uh, organizations have put up websites on signaling. So 
just get on there, do a Google search for railroad signals, and you will just be overwhelmed with the amount of information out there available to you. And if you're going to plan on using signals on your model railroad, I suggest you do some research because, you know, there is just a lot of variability out there. And even today, uh, due to the mergers over the last 50 years, you can find a mixture of railroad signals that you could incorporate on your model railroad. So that's it for today. Have a great weekend. Have a great week. And we'll see you here next time with a video from the DCC Guide. Bye now.